Good afternoon and or good morning and welcome to the first of these analyst debate webinars between myself and my colleague in Toronto, Canada, Colin Szynski. Um, I think one of the reasons Colin and I decided to do one of these debates is I think first and foremost they work better when you can interact with the other person. It's also I think an easy, easy way to invite debate between you, the client, and us, the analysts, and have a general discussion about conditions in the market, trading setups and what have you. But before we really get cracking on this, I just need to make you aware of this risk warning, um, a, a general disclaimer, so that anything that you hear on this webinar is not um, trading advice. Um, really, it's just a debate to sort of talk about ideas um, as to what's going on in the markets and you know potential trading setups as to where we're going to go to next. So let's just quickly get rid of that and now we can crack on. So welcome everybody. As I say, my name is Michael Hewson. Most of you probably know me already and um, Colin, my colleague, is also on the line as well. Hi everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Okay, so Colin, we talked a little bit offline about what equity markets are doing and whether or not we thought that um, they were starting to top out. And it does seem to be some evidence that that might well be the case. Um, however, the, the economic data that we're seeing out of the U.S. at the moment still continues to give conflicting signals. I mean, that industrial production data that we saw earlier today was absolutely horrible, and yet the weekly jobless claims were fairly good. You know, so I think we're still in two minds with respect to what the Fed are going to do or continue to do, and we've obviously got the Fed minutes next week as well. So what are your thoughts on um, you know, the S&P and, and the Dow? I think at this point in time we're seeing that the the S and P and the Dow are both totally exhausted. They've gone, they've been going consistently up since the fall of 2012. They haven't had any major correction in in a serious way in in a long, long time. It's it's all been propelled by by two things really: the the recovering economy in the U S. and uh, but the bigger one has just been this steady inflow of uh, QE money finding its way into the stock market. When you put that kind of money into an economy, it's a lot faster to lend it and and put it to work in the market than it is to lend it and put it to work in, in the regular Main Street economy. So we've had this huge run in the markets here, and, uh, and, and things are just looking tired. The Fed has started tapering. The, uh, the seasonal inflows of capital from people putting money into retirement accounts, the tax deadlines have all passed in, in the U.K. and the U.S. and Canada and, and elsewhere. So that, that spring winter flood of money is, is starting to dry up and and markets are just looking really tired here we had a new all-time high for the dow industrials it was confirmed by the transports which should have been fantastic and the stock market should have been going up 100 points a day instead of down 100 points a day the last two days so we're really looking at an, an, an exhausted market here good news is not pushing it much higher and uh, and it looks like it could be due for a bit of a seasonal correction here now you were talking to me earlier about the nasdaq and um, obviously the Russell 2000 as well. And we've made new highs on the S&P and the Dow. But, you know, if you're looking sort of across markets, those two indexes are actually already rolled over. Uh, they both have. The uh, Russell 2000 has been trending lower for quite a bit of time, and it looks like we're seeing a uh, head and shoulders top in the NASDAQ. And Let's have a look at that, shall we? Absolutely. So I want to talk about the NASDAQ first. And, uh, and what's most significant here... Is, Do you want me to so give you have, control? Yes, please. I will give you control. There you go. So, okay. And I will take control. Okay. So if we look here at the NASDAQ, it had been in uh, in quite a long uptrend here. And, and we're seeing what's really a classic head and shoulders top. If we look here, we've got a left shoulder back in, uh, in January, the head of the pattern at the beginning of March, and this kind of... We really had more of a rolling um, right shoulder here where you've almost got a triple three times where you've hit the same resistance level. It's just not working. And um, and this is in around – I'm sorry, I'm just going to get my uh, – cro where are my crosshairs? Your crosshairs at bottom, down the bottom. Ah, thank you very much. There we go. So I'm just going to bring my crosshairs open here so that this resistance level here around 3600, 3625, 
3630, it keeps bumping mm -hmm. that and it's just not going through. So the left shoulder, right shoulder, same, similar type of level, 3630 here. And what are we getting back today? Again, NASDAQ's rolling back under 30, uh, 3600 today. Uh, mm -hmm. This is important because what you've got in the NASDAQ is a lot of high momentum, high value companies. We're, you're seeing a definite, over the course of this year, a definite contraction in, in valuations. People aren't paying up as much for, uh, for high growth companies as they were willing to do last fall. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the pullbacks in, in Facebook, in Twitter, in, in I'm Tesla. I'm just going to steal that control from you. Okay. Go right ahead. And carry it. Go on. Go on. I'm going to put this on the uh, chart forums, ladies and gents, so um, that you can see it. Colin, you carry on. Okay, great. And, uh, and, and so all of these momentum names and, and even things like Bitcoin, remember you hit a thousand bucks a few months ago, it's now down, down closer to 500. I mean, all these things that had gotten really, really frothy are, are starting to pull back. And that's suggesting that the, uh, the, it's indicative that the hot money that was going into the hot plays, there's not as much of that anymore. And there, it's starting to fall under its own weight. And the markets themselves falling under their own weight, and, and you're seeing it in, in the breadth as well, that the mid caps, the small caps that are, are higher weighting within the Russell 2000 ha are starting to go down. And if you've all, all you've got left is the, the narrowest of indices, like the, the, the industrials and the transports, which have, I think, 30 and 20 stocks um, respectively. And, uh, and, and it's only the narrowest indices that we're making new highs. And, and the other, the broader indices are rolling over is, is, is generally indicative of a, uh, that we're at a turning point in the market. And I think also another clue that um, markets or investors are conflicted with respect to the direction of equity markets at the moment is the performance in the bond markets because the bond markets are going extremely well bid. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you my 10-year note chart here. And I think that's very instructive because for quite some time we've been trading below the 200-day moving average and yields have actually been going up. Now we've broken away and we've aggressively broken away. And that suggests to me that we're probably going to see 2.4 or even 2.3 on the 10-year. Now, if that is the case and we see higher bond prices, then we're going to see a significant move lower, I think, in dollar-yen. We saw overnight that those GDP numbers for Japan were very, very good. Um, and you would ordinarily think that, well, yeah, Arbonomics is working, happy days. And that should, you know, then give the Nikkei a boost. But it's had the exact opposite effect. Why is that? Well, I think the GDP boost was largely as a result of a lot of people, or a lot of consumers, basically front-running the, um, the retail sales tax hike. So they, got a lot, they brought forward an awful lot of their consumer spending. And I think the fact that the GDP number is so good, it means that the Bank of Japan won't do any more easing. And that is going to be yen positive, dollar negative. So I think that's why you're also seeing the breakout um, towards the um, upside in U.S. Treasury prices, and as a result, you're seeing yields come lower as well. But I think there's also a broader question there. It's the fear of deflation, in not only um, in Europe, but also across the globe. And I think that's what's also driving yields lower, not only in the U.S., but also the U.K. and pretty much Europe as well. And what's your take on that, Colin? Uh, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. That's why we're seeing the uh, the ECB certainly talking about um, talking about uh, more stimulus uh, going forward. Is I think it's it's as much driven by the uh, the fear of deflation as the uh, as, as the sluggish economy uh, and trying to get things moving there. I mean, Europe has had a, a sluggish economy for quite some time, and uh, but the the ECB has you know basically been letting it kind of work itself out, and. Um, and only now they're starting to talk about getting more aggressive and and as I said I think it's the uh, the deflation worry and that's why I think we're seeing the uh, the money starting to flow back more recently again out of the uh, out of the the high and frothy stock markets back into uh, back into some of the more defensive markets that had come down lately so you're seeing uh, US bonds starting to pick up we've seen the gold is having up and down days but it at least looks like it's uh, kind of stabilizing and, and certainly interest coming back into the uh, into the yen as well Mm. And also Canada is starting to look a little bit better supported despite some of the, um, for what I should say, choppy nature of the jobs data that we've, we've, we've seen out of um, North America. And I think one of the things I've noticed about the Canadian jobs data is how different it has been from 
US jobs data, and we've got a nice little breakout here on the EuroCAD. I don't know whether you guys have been watching this, but this was something that I posted, I think, a couple of days ago, and actually talked about on my weekly video. This head and shoulders reversal that we've broken out of, and um, you know, basically, this is a very simple technique that I use for measuring a target for the head and shoulders reversal. So what I'll do is, I've, first and foremost, I'll identify it. One of the reasons, one of the ways I can do that is using pattern recognition. And when I used pattern recognition on um, Euro Canada, what I was able to do, or what it was able to do, is it was able to identify that pattern for me. So I was able to see it right there once it had scanned the chart. Um, what I was then able to do is by using my Fibonacci projection price, Fibonacci price projections option here, I basically select this high here, and I basically project down to the base and then project lower from the breakout point, and that gives me my targets. So my target if for this head and shoulders breakout now is around about 145.50. So as long as we can push below this series of lows in February, which, um, which I will just now get rid of this, there we go, this series of lows in February, which is around about 149. If we look at the chart forums again, there it is. Okay, so this was something I updated on the 13th on the Monday. So we need to break below 149 to confirm a move towards the 200-day moving average and this trend line support, which if I now zoom it out all the way back to 2012, basically comes in round about the same level. So that's a really nice head and shoulders that's sort of blown, sort of been born out by this move lower in the euro. And um, certainly this morning's GDP numbers out of the euro area, Germany notwithstanding, would seem to suggest we're going to get something from the ECB. Um, the only really debate really surrounds is as to what we're going to see. I don't think we'll see any QE, but I certainly think we'll see a movement on rates. What's, you know, what's your view on that? Uh, I think you're right. Can I uh, take control back again for a second, You Michael? can indeed, yeah. Let me just assign that back to you. One yeah, thing that's important one, one and, and that Michael's highlighted here, and, and I think it's important for us to note as, as traders, is that whenever you're looking at a, at a pattern or, or at a chart, the more things that come together to, to suggest that something could happen, the, the greater the level of confidence. So in, in this case, for example, when you're looking at, a, at projecting a price where you have a Fibonacci and, and a trend line coming in closer to, close together or, or what I call clustering, when you start to see a number of things pointing to a certain area, markets can be psychologically drawn to that point. So it's, uh, it's quite significant. The other thing I wanted to highlight here was, of course, we've got the, the shorter term, we've got the price pattern. The other thing that we have, in uh, in here is uh, on top of having a, a head and shoulders top and uh, and some shorter term trend line breaks. If we look down here at the stochastics, we also see that we have a pretty significant and been going on for quite some time a negative divergence. So you've got high, lower highs in the stochastics, and it's been similar in the RSI. And meanwhile, you have higher high, you had higher highs in the in the pair and and that negative divergence tells you that there's a, a shift in momentum going on so you've got the negative divergence telling you momentum is changing from upward to downward you've got a massive head and shoulder top which is a big reversal pattern and and you start breaking the neckline there so you've got a lot of things are starting to come together to suggest that this trend is uh, is uh, uh, changing yeah, I mean that's absolutely right. I mean, and what's one of the things that um, you know I also look at? I also look across asset classes. So you know, when you're looking at say the euro, it's important to not just look at the euro dollar, but it's also important to look at the crosses as well. So if I could just still control back, Colin. Absolutely. Um, um, and uh, just uh, just turn that off. What we can what we can do now is let's let's shut that off and let's look at Euro Aussie. Because I think Euro Aussie will probably give you a similar sort of shake up with respect to a top forming pattern. That looks and like it's already even completed and I think that's probably completed and reached out and now we're looking to test that support line from from those lows in in the middle of two thousand and thirteen last year. So we've broken below the two hundred day moving average and now we're testing this key support line here. 
Okay, so we've looked at that. Now let's look at euro dollar because I, th I think there's potential for a, a bit of a support level coming in round about the 200 day moving average, which is round about here. And we've held above that low that, low that I identified um, earlier, which is round about 136.40, 136.50. If we also look at the 200 day moving average that comes in at around 136.20. So if you take these two pies here, I've drawn it through that peak there. We didn't close above there and we closed significantly below there. That was obviously Mr. Draghi, um, as you can see from the very long shadow on the top of the candle there. Um, and then draw a line through these lows here. Then there is a potential double top formation forming there. The only thing that's giving me pause about this particular one is the fact that the oscillator is very, very oversold and we also um, remain above support at 136.40 and we also remain above the 200 day moving average. So you've got two support zones starting to come into play and if you are short then you really need to be careful about being overly short, particularly given the fact that we are at two month lows on euro dollar. You've really got to ask yourself how much of this euro down move is priced in Yes, we look at Euro Canada and we can see Euro Canada's broken out and Euro Canada could go lower, but it could be a Canada move, not a Euro move. And therefore, you could get a bounce in Euro dollar and Euro Canada could still go down. So I think it's important to, to look at that because you have to look at the potential interest rate policies of both central banks as well as obviously the um, linkages between the two um, or, or the, different, the different crosses. It's a different story for Euro Sterling. We can see that here because we pretty much know that um, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank are on completely divergent monetary policies. So let's tidy this chart up a bit because it's looking a little bit, a little bit tatty at the moment. We're in, a, we're in a downtrend. I'm going to make sure that I can anchor my trend line onto the top of these highs there. And then I can basically draw that through there. So we're trading in a nice little down channel there. Uh, we've had a very, very strong rebound yesterday, but we've pretty much come all the way back. Now that's not to say that we haven't found a short term base down here and we can't squeeze back up again. I certainly think there's potential for, to, for us to come all the way back to around about 82.20 um, given the fact that it was quite a big support area through these, these levels here. And then when I'm, when I'm looking at a chart um, for support and resistance levels, this is something that I look at in a significant amount of detail. I look at the peaks and the troughs and I look for what Colin has mentioned earlier, clustering. A clustering of support and resistance levels which essentially tells you where the congestion points are with respect to highs and lows. So if I can basically extend that to the left like that, you can see that we also found a little bit of a high and low, a little bit of a low support there and there and there. So if you've got any positions or short positions in Euro Sterling, then I would certainly look at putting the stop loss either above 82 or above this trend line resistance, which is coming down from the March highs. Is there anything that you'd like to have a look at, Colin, or talk about? Um, um, could you go back to Euro Aussie for a second, Michael? I can indeed, yep. Do you want me to see control? So you can uh, yes, please. I wanted to uh, mention something in terms of trading and, and confidence. So okay. we had this big right. run here. Oh, sorry. I'll just wait a second. That's all right. There you go. Hang on. Giving you control back. There Thank you, go. you very much. So we have this. Uh, uh, we've had again another head and shoulders top pattern in uh, in the Euro Aussie. And uh, and what I wanted to, to note here for uh, for traders to consider is that uh, when you see a pattern forming, there, there's three different times that you can put on a, a, a trade. You could either go in ahead of time and say, okay, well this looks like a head and shoulders top to me. Here's a left shoulder back in December. Here's a head back in uh, in January. And then I'm sitting here in March and gee, this looks like a shoulder forming to me, maybe it's time to go short. The second time where somebody might uh, consider putting on a, uh, a trade is on the breakdown. So you had this neckline here, which you broke quite decisively right at the end of March. And the third time is on the retest. So you saw that it came down here, you had a bit of follow through, then you came back and this is about 140, 149, zero, zero. And you came down and you've retested this, uh, this 150 
You've mm-hmm. retested, which is also interesting because it's a nice big round number, another part of uh, clustering. So you've got 150 here. You've come back, you've retested it, and look at this. Now you're down, and now you're into new lows again, and your downtrend is actually accelerating. So. What happens, obviously, clearly, is that your your measured move from your pattern would stay the same. So the difference between whether you go ahead of the breakout, on the breakout, or on the retest is your return potential to the same point as lower. I mean, obviously, if, say, your target is uh, is down here around these lows around, say, 142. So if you went short at, at 155 or at 150 or waited and maybe went 149.50, so your return potential to the target is a little bit lower, but your confidence is higher. You're in a right shoulder. You don't know if it's going to uh, be completed or not. You're on the breakout. Well, you've seen a breakout, but you, you've given up. It's improved your confidence because you've had the breakdown, but it's decreased your return potential a little bit. And then on the retest, um, in this particular case, we got one. The risk of waiting for a retest is that you don't always get a retest, and sometimes it just the trade gets away on you. But uh, and certainly in the markets, there's always a uh, there's always another trade coming. But that's uh, that's an interesting. Uh, it's a trade-off there that's uh, that's worthwhile for people to consider when you're looking at patterns. I think that's absolutely right. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Colin. You know, I think it's easy to sometimes jump in because you're worried about missing the move. But I think it's always better to be cautious um, and and make the mistake of jumping in too early and then finding that you can't run the stop as much as you'd like and actually getting stopped out prematurely. I always I always work on the basis, let the market come to you because there will always be another trading opportunity. And, um, you know, they're like London buses. We have, you know, we have an old joke here in, in the U.K. Um, you don't see a London bus for about, you know, 20 or 30 minutes and suddenly three of them come along at the same time. It never so fails. It, it's the same here. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know, it's, trading is a bit like that. Sometimes the best position to have is no position at all. And then suddenly you'll see three great trading opportunities, you know, and um, then you're spoilt for choice. So I think it's always important to, you know, remember that um, just because you can't see a trading opportunity right now doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to see um, some trading opportunities in the near future. Okay, Colin, was there anything else that you wanted um, to um, to look at? Um, shall we look at gold? Sure, sure let's look at take gold. A look at gold. That, that, that's always a nice old favourite. That's been extremely choppy today. Um, I'm going to look at that daily chart there, but before I do that, um, let's just pull it, pull this to one side, and um, and uh, we'll also do. Uh, an ordinary chart. We'll just do an ordinary chart like that, and then we'll do slightly shorter term. There we go. And as we can see from that, we've been a bit choppy over the last four hours. Um, but for me, you know, this this longer term gold chart tells me that at the moment we're in a massive consolidation mode. If we look at these very very long shadows on the daily candles, we can see here that there's certainly an awful lot of what I would call pent-up demand down there because a long shadow on a candle tells me that the markets are very, very worried about being overly short. Um, and yet on the top side, we've also got um, the 50-day moving average acting as a significant resistance level. So let's go and basically stick this in here and here. And now there's a, there's a potential trading opportunity there. On the top side, we've got resistance just below 13.10. We've also got the 50-day moving average. So we've got a very, very small window there, and we can see that on the left-hand side, 13.11, around 13.15. We need this to break out, I think, probably within the next day or so, don't we, Colin? Because I think if it moves into the apex here, it, it'll, it'll generally peter out. The thing with triangles, and I like triangles, is that you, you're really looking to either you're looking to trade the break because they're impulsive moves. We, what we don't want to have happen is for this move to just basically peter out into the apex. Now the apex is all the way over in June, so I think if we're going to break out in gold, we need to do either break to the upside, and the way to then project the target for gold is again use the Fibonacci projections option here, the Fibonacci price. You basically take the move here, which is the horizontal move, and that's the base of your triangle, and you then project up like that, 
or you project down the other way. So if this breaks out to the top side, then if this breaks out to the top side, then our target, our minimum price objective is $1,364, $1,364. And a simple measuring technique, you basically take the base of the triangle and you project it upwards from the breakout point. If it breaks to the downside, you do the exact opposite. So let's do this the other way around. Let's project it downwards. So rather than going from the bottom to the top, let's go from the top to the bottom. We'll do that. And then we'll do, do that there. So if it breaks to the downside, then we're looking at 1226 as the minimum price objective. And that's essentially how you play triangles. But, and this is a big but, a triangle needs to break out between 50 and 75% of where its apex is. So really this triangle needs to break out within the next day or so. Otherwise, what we're going to continue to do is essentially trade sideways. There's certainly a significant amount of support on the gold price, around about this 1270, 1265 area. I'd like to think that we're getting ready for a move higher or lower. The oscillator or the RS, the slow stochastic would appear to indicate that we're fairly neutral and it's probably more likely that we're just going to trade trade into the apex and continue with the current range. But it's certainly worth something keeping an eye on and if we do close above the 50 day moving average I would like to think we could have some potential to move higher because I think if anyone's looking at that chart and they're short of gold they'll probably put their stop loss above the previous highs of this month in May which are around about $1,320. Yes indeed and I mean it's certainly the um I think what we're seeing here in gold is is we're definitely in a uh, in a range bound market, which uh, which also is uh, is important for when you are uh, when you are trading and looking to uh, to set stop losses is that uh, you, you need to consider that rather than looking at, at this chart and thinking you know gee can gold take a run back up at at 1390 is adjusting the expectations that if we do get a break here well maybe we'll get a retest of 1330 and because gold is kind of range bound that's what we we need to be uh, prepared to settle for and in which case then what's your what's your downside so say if you're here and you're um <clears throat> You're measuring, and if you were looking at a, a current price on gold of uh, it's sitting right on 1300, your uh, your initial Short resistance control. is up here around 1315, and then uh, and then up here around 1330. So where are we within our trading range? Well, we've got a low here around 1270, and our high is around 1330. So uh, I, if we're just going to be within our range here on 1300. It's a 50-50 proposition. It's $30 up, it's $30 down within this uh, within this range. So then we ask ourselves, well, what would make things a little bit more interesting? So let's just, well, I'm just going to drop these um, lines on here so we can see the, tra the channel. So there it is there. And then, now what makes this a little bit attractive? Well, one thing we've got, we do have this nice trend here of, uh, of higher lows, but it's offset by the trend of lower highs. So if you get a breakout, then you're likely, you've got a pretty good chance at the, at the top of the triangle. If you don't get to then get a breakout and you stay here underneath uh, 1300, your first support around this trend line is about 1280, and then you've got more around 1270. So it's a matter of... Uh, of in this in this particular case when you're playing this kind of market is shortening your time horizons and shortening your objectives is there a smaller trade within this that might work as well to uh, for people to consider there's always there's always opportunities it's just that sometimes the opportunities are bigger than uh, than others all right cheers thanks colin so if we've looked at gold so we think there's probably potential for a little bit more upside potentially in that but overall i think we we're both agreed it's probably going to continue to trade in the range that it's been trading in for about the past five or six weeks let's have a quick look at um sterling because we haven't really had a look at that yet and we've got the bank of england minutes next week can i say um, one more thing on gold michael sure yeah absolutely yes, do you want good. control back so uh, no, I just wanted to say, so here, if you're at 1300, it's a 50-50 proposition. But if gold, but if you figure that, okay, this trading range is going to continue for some time, if you drop back to 1280 and you're in a 1270 to 1330 uh, trading channel, your odds change dramatically. If, say, you go back to 1280, you've got $10 downside to 1270, you've got $50 upside to 1330, uh, trade, the trade then starts to look a lot more interesting from the long side. And similarly, if you took a run at 1320, 20, 1330, it may look more interesting from the short side. 
Okay. Anyway, sorry, Michael, please continue. No, no, that's fine. That's no problem. So let's look at cable. And we can see from this cable chart that, you know, despite the fact that euro dollar is starting to look a little bit heavy and equity markets are looking fairly heavy, cable continues to look fairly resilient. It's finding support. Um, we, did, we did break below this um, trend line support from the March lows earlier this week. We are now trading below that, but we are finding a significant area of support around about um, the 50-day or just above the 50-day moving average, which is around about 167.20. And, and in my morning comment um, this morning, and actually in my morning comment for about the past couple of days, I have identified 167.20 as a bit of a level, and that's available on the blog. I tweeted out around about 6.30 in the morning, um, you know, of the, of the major currency pairs, euro sterling, euro dollar, dollar yen, and cable. I talk about, you know, the major, the major support and resistance levels to give an indication of direction. And certainly against the dollar, the pound has held up much the better of, say, the example, the euro. But we are approaching a very, very key support level. So unlike euro dollar, which has broken below this, its trend line support, the pound hasn't. And the, we've got trend line support from the November lows currently coming in round about current levels of 167.10, 167.20. So that's certainly worth keeping an eye on. Um, um, certainly, certainly on, on, the, on the daily charts, even though the direction of travel does appear to suggest that we could well be looking to head lower. But I think a lot will depend on next week's minutes because I think that we're going to see some dissent between policymakers about when to raise interest rates. Certainly, I think the unemployment rate that we saw, the unemployment data that we saw out this week speaks to a direction of travel, 6.8%. Average earnings was slightly disappointing, and I think that's really what drove um, the pound down on Wednesday. And I think more than anything, we've got CPI next week. I think more than anything, the Bank of England is not targeting CPI anymore. It's targeting average earnings growth. And I think they won't be too bothered if CPI falls back to 1.4, 1.3, 1.2. I think they will be concerned if average earnings starts to push too far away from CPI. So if we go above 2%, we go to 2.5% and, and we go to 3 I think you'll see um, concerns rising that maybe interest rates may come sooner rather than later. But for the moment, the odds are, given what we're seeing at the moment and given what Carney said yesterday, we'll probably see it after the election next year, which is probably entirely what um, the coalition government really want to happen. I don't think they want to see a rate rise before the election. Okay, what I'm going to do now, guys, is I'm going to wrap up the recording uh, for this week, wind it up. You're more than welcome. We're, we're going to carry on talking um, if you want us to. If there's anything that you want us to cover, any market that you want us to cover, use the chat feature right now. We're going to carry on, but we're going to stop recording um, simply because the file size is too big and then it becomes too big to upload to YouTube after we've done it. So for the purposes of the recording, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, until the same time or a similar time next month, we'll definitely do this again. Thank you all very much for joining us today.